Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to CKFW, the Motor City. Was anyone at the statue of Bailey today? Was that not amazing? And Burton Cummings showed up. Uh, Burton Cummings showed up. We saw him in the video just now. He gave a very passionate speech thanking Rosalie Tremblay for his career. We have an amazing history in this city, the statue in real. And the story of the Big Eight is one of the things that makes Windsor so effortlessly cool. I love the statue of Rosalie that it faces, beautifully sculpted by Donna Jean Main, by the way. I love that it is of Rosalie facing Detroit. She's planted here on our beautiful riverfront, facing Detroit, which that skyline, that skyline is as home to, I think, all of us as the buildings here in Windsor are. And I love what that statue says. Tonight is about stories and sounds that connected us, the universal language of music. And just like lightning striking, you cannot plan it. You can't replicate it. And just like the music, the personalities, the team behind the Big Eight were nothing short of electric, like lightning. It was a moment in time, and it was a perfect moment. Just some of the names that graced the airwaves, some who were joining us on stage, some who were in the audience, some who could not be here tonight, some who were no longer with us. Jim Jackson, Scott Miller, Terry Miller, uh, Terry Scott, Susan Nixon, Gary Morningmouth Burbank, Big Jim Edwards, Brother Bill Gable, Pat Holliday, Steve Hunter, Super Max Kinkle, uh, Walt Baby Love, Charlie O'Brien, Ted the Bear Richards, Mike Rivers, Duke Roberts, Charlie Van Dyke, Johnny Williams, Newsman Randy Carlisle, Grant Hudson, Byron McGregor, and speaking of which, somebody else who broke a lot of gender barriers, the first female helicopter traffic news reporter in North America. She's here tonight, JoJo Shetty McGregor. person we are remembering today, uh, music director Rosalie Tremblay, who became famous, legendary, for being the girl with the golden ear, blurring lines, gender lines, racial lines, rock and roll, R&B. What I've been hearing is a common theme throughout the day today. It was about the music, good music, important music. Many believe that it integrated music. The integrated music playlist helped bring Detroiters together, especially during the race riots of 1967. Rosalie hired in 63 uh, and was accepted a position in the music library. Fall of 68 was offered the full-time position as CKLW's music director, a job she later attributed to being in the right place at the right time. And think about how many careers might have been different if she wasn't in the right place at the right time. That perfect storm and then the lightning that strikes. This seems to be what made the station work. Everyone from the artists who were putting, that they were, the music they were putting out, people working the station, everyone was doing exactly what they were supposed to do at the right time, like lightning. Rosalie served as music director of CKLW from 1968 to 1984. And in November of 2021, we lost Rosalie. And at the time, we could not do a proper celebration of life to honor Rosalie. And today, with the Big 8 edition of Open Streets, the statue unveiling, the exhibition at the Chimchuck Museum, the screening tonight of Radio Revolution by Michael McNamara, who is here in the audience this evening. This event right here and now that we are all attending very much has that feeling, a celebration of life for Rosalie Trombley, filled with nostalgia, but much the same way the spirit of music is eternal, her influence will live on forever. As her son, Tim Trombley, said earlier this morning at that statue unveiling, Rosalie was the original influencer. Her birthday is tomorrow, making this evening extra special. Uh, the stories, as you can imagine, are infinite, much like the sounds, the eternal, glorious, timeless songs and voices broadcast out of that 50,000 watt blowtorch. And tonight is about listening to some of that music, and I know you all are music fans in here tonight. It's about unlocking those memories in a way that only music can do, and hearing some of those stories that never get old from some of the people who live them. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage tonight, roaring through the hits every night on the Big A evening job, Ted the Bear Richards. <laughs> internationally known air talent, Pat Holliday. <laughs> founder and CEO of Afterplay Entertainment Executive, or co-founder of Network 
networks including VH1, MTV, The Box Television Network, and also program director at CKLW. He is also the DJ featured prominently in Jefferson Starships, We Build This City, Les Garland. children here tonight. I want to welcome to the stage <laughs> Tim Trumley. Not going to cross the Golden Gate Bridge on another beat up. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be that kind of night, I can tell. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, for coming here to this day. Does uh, does Ted need a mic? I think we, I think uh, Ted needs a mic down there. There we go. Testing. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. So just a little bit, if we can talk, we'll, 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 we'll go around here before we listen to some music and watch some videos and whatnot, but uh, we'll, we'll go around and talk about your time, how you got into the CKLW, CKLW, your time there. Tim, we'll start with you. This day has to be an emotional day for you, boy. It's been a very emotional day for me, for my brother and sister. I don't know what to say. I mean, I said it earlier this morning. It's like she raised three kids on her own. I don't know how she did it with having such an amazing job and such a demanding job. Um, just a remarkable woman, you know, with, with such an innate gift for music. It, it's still, for me, 64 years later, you know, hard to figure out how she did it, how she balanced her personal life, raising three kids as a single mother, on her own, and how she had this gift for picking music. It, it, you know, truthfully, in a lot of ways, serendipitous that this opportunity came to her, literally, literally the summer that our father walked out on the family, so it's just, you know, I believe things happen in life for a reason, and I believe Rosalie was meant to bring her gift to the world through her innate ability to pick hit records. Uh, Les, your, your time as music uh, as program director at the legendary CKLW, can you reflect a bit on that time? I don't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a small town boy from a small town in Missouri, and I got lucky and went off to the big city and did things those big city boys didn't know how to do. We were guilty of having a lot of fun. <laughs> Everything that we did, I, I was noticing as I was watching the video, did you not, there was not one photo of Rosalie mm -hmm. which she was not having fun. Mm -hmm. And she, 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 she transmitted that. It was powerful. And she would, she, she didn't just walk into a room, she made an entrance into a room. And she was just this magical lady. We've talked a lot today and read and heard a lot about golden ears. Yeah. She had a golden heart and a golden soul and a golden brain and a, a golden presence about herself. That's, that's how music translated through her body and knowing what people wanted to hear, what would be a hit song. She could hear a hit record like nobody I ever met in my life. She was, honestly, I don't remember her ever being wrong. No. Ever. And that's unheard of. Nobody bets a thousand in music. <laughs> but um, I, uh, gosh. Okay, so CKLW for me was this monster radio station that I had heard of. And I got lucky. I, there was a guy we, we, we talked about, probably no one in this room has ever heard of a guy called Bill Drake. Yeah. Legendary, legendary Bill Drake. Uh, better known as Phil Yarborough from Atlanta, Georgia. And he discovered me when I was about 23 years old, actually. And uh, it was an accident. I ended up going to work for Bill Drake. Funny sidebar story, this is not about me, but it's how I ended up here. And I was in Fresno at the pilot station. Pilot station for the Drake radio format. The Drake radio format was on the biggest radio stations in America, if not in the world. And it was called the Drake format. That would be KHJ in Los Angeles, KFRC in San Francisco, WRKO in Boston, uh, HBQ in Memphis, CKLW in Detroit, which was owned by RKO in the beginning. It was an RKO station, and then laws came down where 
Uh, Americans couldn't own radio stations in Canada, and Canadians couldn't own radio stations in America, which is how it fell into the hands of Baton Broadcasting. Uh, yep. And uh, let me tell you something. It was, <laughs> it was uh, just hearing the letters, CKLW, every air, and I don't, I stopped calling great radio personalities like the ones on this stage here tonight. I stopped calling them DJs. Uh, anybody can be a DJ, but not very many people can be a radio personality mm -hmm. and can have a skill to communicate with the audience like Pat, Teddy, you know, the staff at that great radio station. It was legendary. Uh, everybody wanted to work at CKLW. It was either there, KFRC, KHJ, and occasionally WLS in Chicago. That was, that's where every young, up-and-coming, striving air personality wanted to be. And uh, it came my way, and it was a bit of a miracle. There are, we need those in life. And I've looked back on it in, in some retrospect, and that's when I was lucky enough to hop on that big, gigantic wave and surf that wave right on through the MTV experience, VH1, and the things that have come my way. Had it not been for CKLW, I actually believe none of that would have ever happened to me personally. It was really jumping on the gigantic wave and uh, just writing it, really more writing it. You, we could, if you try to steer it, you're gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, and my memories just go on and on. I really, I could sit here, I could tell you a million stories of, of things that keep coming back and certainly the last 12 hours today, it's just been unbelievable. But I, I, I just can't take my mind off of the great times. It was the most fun. That people really cared for each other, genuinely loved each other, had each other's back. And uh, I don't remember, I honestly, I do not remember any, uh, what, what you would call it, a disgruntled no. people complaining. CKLW was a place you looked forward to going into because it was a blast and it, it was entertainment and it was fun. And uh, I was noted to be a guy who didn't need a lot of sleep. And uh, I, I was famously there at seven o'clock in the morning, and it, sometimes I came from the wrong side of the clock. But it was good being there. We enjoyed being there. It was just, it was, it was our life. It was our, it was our life. And I don't know that, that I don't know that that exists anymore. I, I, I'm fearful that it doesn't in radio. I, I think you'd hear it. I learned how to go into a town, and I could listen to a radio station for three hours and tell you if these people are having fun or not. You could feel it. You could hear it coming out the, the transmitter. CKLW was all of that. One of the, I mentioned something to the guys today that, 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 that some of them didn't even know, but we tried to do some really cool things back then. And we had tried to cut a deal with the CRTC, and uh, we needed permission to do this. But, you know, CK was 50,000 watts on 800. You've heard the yeah. stories. 38 states in America at night. You talk about a big wave. and. <laughs> I found a radio station down in Mexico, on the other side of the border in Texas, 50,000 watts on 800. I went to them to see if they'd be interested in simulcasting with us, and we were going to put the big eight on two signals, 800, 50,000 watts covering all of North America. And we came close to pulling that off. So I went to the big eight and became a big thinker. <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump out here, but uh, it was a highlight of my life. There's in my radio years and the, uh, the things that have come my way in my life. CKLW is at the top of that list. Mr. Connolly, your your time at CKLW. How you got into it? Just your initial thoughts and memories. Um, for me, um, it was really interesting. I, the first time I heard CKLW, I was working in a little, tiny little station in upstate New York, and I'm playing, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm playing Christmas sounds. So now, El Martino, brought to you by Sonto Funeral, <laughs> and you play the, you know, no, honestly, you play the, you, know, you play half the side, you turn it over and say something like that again, and you can play it again. And I'm bored out of my mind, so I went over to the, in the, this is in the U.S., so mostly New York, in the U.S., they had this EBS system where they, you know, you, you'd hear it on the Detroit station, you know, they, this is a test, this is the test of the emergency. <laughs> okay. okay, so I went over to that thing because it's a big tuner, and I'm thinking, oh, this is crazy. So I start tuning, and everybody's doing what I'm doing, and it's like super boring. And then I, I hit, I come up around 800 that I know now, and it's like, what is this station? Because there's no Christmas music. 
They are rocking on Christmas Eve, full tilt. And, and in CK, it's the first time I, you know, I heard this. I said, wow, this is awesome. What is this all about? Found out more, flash forward a year later, this speaks to how being big. Again, I'm in the you know, middle of New York State, kind of almost on the Hudson River. I'm now in Hartford. I'm doing nights at 6 to 10, and I'm copying CKLW and I'm mailing air checks here to try to get a job. No, no, honestly, yeah. So, you know, I'm working 6 to 10 because at, at 10 o'clock at night when I want to get off the air and go home, or to go out and get something to eat, the loudest station on the dial in Hartford, Connecticut, a thousand kilometers from here was CKLW. It was just, it was beyond being a local. So, I mean, that's how big that thing was. And it's like, uh, I got to work there. So, you know, eventually, you know, I got hired here and, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about this, but I, I just find this amazing. I, the first day I got here, I went into the, we were on Riverside Drive, you know, where CBC is now. So I go into the, uh, the lunchroom and Rosalie's office in the music library is like, one, you know, it's kind of like a vending machine, vending machine, vending machine, door. Oh, okay. So I kind of look in and there's, there's two ladies in there and I walk in and I just get in the door. What do you want? Who are you? <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, here we go. And I so, uh, you know, I'm a new jock, I'm a new guy on the air. And I'm a kid, I think like I'm 22 or 21. And she goes, I don't care, we're working. It's, you know, we're doing the church, get out. <laughs> so she throws me out and so I keep going back, I keep going back, I keep going back. And so, you know, this is kind of the way she is. And, and then all of a sudden, I'm in the, the same thing, I'm out there, but I'm, I'm you know, definitely afraid of just sort of walking in, I kind of go by the door, and now like, it's not happening. She comes walking out, because she would do this with a lot of people, she would give them shots of things that you wouldn't normally get a, get a shot at. She goes, you want to meet Jose Feliciano? And I go, yeah, for sure. Okay, come with me, but don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> she takes me into the office, she goes, sit in that chair right there, don't say a word. And I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, national promo guy comes in, there's Jose Feliciano, and, he's, and there's, a, you know, there's some woman there with him, I, I don't you know, girlfriend or something, I don't know. And, you know, they talk and whatever, and I'm just like, wow, this is really awesome. And, uh, and then, anyway, from that point on, it's like, I could walk into the room, and I spent hours in the room, learning radio because that was like a doctorate course in music and other things that was priceless uh, for, for later on is you know for the rest of my career is is very cool but you know <laughs> that's that's me. and then actually i used to babysit <laughs> to the kids yeah i mean you know, like to speak to what's saying it was a really close knit um, you know close knit group of people we were all sort of family to ourselves and, and men you don't see that in any business, hardly, and, you know, even then, but for sure not now very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the coolest babysitter ever, first of all. I just can't, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Where's the spaghetti hose? Anywhere in the one? <laughs> uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Ted the Bear Richards. You, your time at CQLW, when you reflect back. Well, for me, it was. It was an awesome experience. Pat, give him your mic. Yeah, turn it on. Thank you. <laughs> Where's that? I always get the older mics, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I got used to that. I got used to that. So, the first time I heard Boss Radio with Bill Drake, I was in the military in California, and I heard this station called KFRC, which this man, Les Garland, when he left CKLW, he went to Boston, I, I believe Boston, and then to KFRC and made that station like just a monster AM station, the big 610. But I was in California in 67, I heard Boss Radio, we had the more music, the jocks were just awesome. And I said, hey, I wanna, I wanna get into this somehow when I get out of the military. So uh, anyway, Long story short, I ended up going to Africa for a while in the Air Force, and I said to my roommate one day, maybe one day I'll go to a 50,000 watt station in Canada. I don't know why I said that. I didn't even know of any stations in Canada, but that came out of my mouth. 
Anyway, I get out, I get hired um, to, to go to Jacksonville, Florida, where we had the Drake jingles, the more music which you've seen in the, the Rise and Fall. And so we were doing the Drake um, copycat there and doing our best. And after a couple of years, you just say, you know, you have a goal in mind. You want to make the top 10 markets before you're 25. That was my goal. And so I uh, sent a tape to CKLW. They had an opening for weekends. And I just scribbled down to all and I don't want a weekend job, but if you get something full time, I'd like to, you know, work for you. Anyway, uh, that's how that happened. And um, a little bit later, I'll tell you how me and Alton met, and I met Rosalie for the first time. But to me, CKLW was the only station that I ever wanted to work for and really never leave. I love that station. I got there in March of 72, and I didn't even leave until me and Pat and Rosalie and everybody else in December of 84 said, you know, you have to leave now. So, 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 like, it was like it was over, and uh, so at least we got our severance pay. And when you're there from '72 to '85, it's a pretty good check. And I went out and bought a Hyundai. First year, never buy a car made in the first year. Oh my God. To tell you a story when I was working in Detroit living in Windsor and that car broke down at 4 30 a.m. in the morning on 75. I thought I was gonna be you know disappearing. <laughs> it was crazy. I got rid of that car. So anyway but that was the only place I wanted to work. It was so good and uh, I went around singing jingles. I, it was the only station when we when we were or me when I was not on the air I listened to the jock on the big eight. That was the only station I listened to. Oh, anyway. Amazing. Well, is everyone ready to listen to some music tonight? Yeah. It's a listening party. It's some storytelling. Let's do it. I mean, a legendary for breaking a lot of artists and a lot of Canadian artists, too. Putting a lot of Canadian artists on the map. Burton Cummings this morning said he toured with the Canadian flag as his backdrop in their heyday, which was amazing to hear. Imagine seeing that. So we'll give a listen right now to, uh, to some music about you know, the, the process of finding and breaking Canadian artists. There we go, the Bachman Turner Overdrive for you. That gets you going, doesn't it? Do the songs bring you back or what? Right? Uh, good sound system in here. It's, it sounds pretty decent here in the Capitol Theater. Some good sound. You know, just just the impact of Canadian artists. You know, we heard, we heard there, we heard the Guess Who, obviously. Uh, David Foster with Skylar, Five Man Electrical Band, Bachman Turner Overdrive, Andy Kim, Edward Bear. You know, uh, Pat, maybe you could even talk about this. Just what it meant to be a Canadian artist to be played. On the big eight. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be huge. I mean, what, you know, one of the things about this, which is really um, a testament to Rosalie's ear, um, in the in the beginning, Canadian content was 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 there was only a handful of good artists at the time because it was a new industry. Like it really, it's like now it's like okay, there's tons of Canadian artists that are worldwide everywhere, but there was only a few then. But but the station. And especially being on the border, you know, we had to kick in 30%, which is essentially roughly 200 songs a day. You know, and you can't, you, you know, you gotta keep repeating stuff, so you want really good songs. But it was the infancy of the recording industry in Canada. It didn't really hit stride until around 2004, 2005. That's when, you know, Carly Jepsen and Bieber and all the, you know, and there's a bazillion great Canadian artists, and the industry came up to it, producers, writers, everything, you know, it's like, you know, they could hold it so anywhere in the world. But in the beginning, it was tough. So she had to hunt through album after album and single after single to try to find ones where it's like, okay, we're going to have to play this. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it's good enough. We can, we, can, we can do it and still have a radio station. At the same time that every other AM radio station in North America was getting pummeled by FM radio stations and you know ultimately switching to news talk and CK was pretty much the last one to kind of to like okay you, know, you, you kind of can't go any further and that's like another 10 12 year ride more than that that's like more than a 14 year ride from that point because of her ear sifting through so many songs 
to come up with enough for us to play. You know, if we anywhere inside Canada wouldn't have been a big deal. Being on the border with 40 Detroit stations, it's like, ooh, you got a chore there. Uh, to, you know, to, to kind of build a radio station, um, you know, with stuff that you wouldn't normally play. Again, now not a big deal. Uh, but back then, so that's, you know, my thought. In addition to, um, you know, like, you know, Terry Jackson, the Poppy family, and, uh, um, you know, and Edwin Bear and those other ones. I mean, you know, I saw her a bazillion times go out of her way to make calls, you know, into the U.S. You know, you know, I'm with one of the national people. No, I got a song here. This is really a legitimate hit. What's that about? Oh, here, I'm going to send it to you. And she'd explain it all. Sometimes play it on the phone a little bit, which they probably couldn't hear real well. Um, but, you know, ones that would have never seen the light of day, not in a million years, uh, because nobody would even know about them. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, I'm reminded of uh, something that radio once owned, Discovery. I bet most of the people here, you remember that first time you heard a song that became your favorite song, and you discovered it on radio. It doesn't happen anymore. No. Today's youth generation finds a new song on TikTok, and uh, they listen to about 17 seconds of it, and they go around the house singing the hook, telling their mom and dad it's their favorite new song. They've never even heard the entire song. It's a new world out there in this digital age. Uh, there are 120,000 new songs a day going on Spotify. Wow. And somebody recently asked me in an interview what I thought about that. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit outspoken, and I said, well, uh, 120,000 songs a day going on Spotify to me sounds like about 119,999 pieces of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Rosalie could find that one song. Yeah. <laughs> I, I almost feel like that was an advantage we had here in Windsor as a border city. A, we had Detroit there. And even to this day, uh, you, you compare Windsor to a city like Toronto or any other city, we had different taste in music because we had that Detroit influence. And that's, at the same time, that's what kind of ended up being a border city, ended up kind of hurting the Big Eight because we had to, we had to apply CanCon laws. Yeah. And that's what kind of killed the Big Eight in a weird, ironic way. We didn't look at it like a negative. We said, let's treat this as something positive. Let's treat this as a, let's find some new music. Let's find new artists. Let's find a new sound. Nothing more powerful than music, right? It leaves an impression like a photo cat. It's the most powerful art form I believe there is in the world. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, it served me well, that's for sure. And it started out with a young kid who fell in love with the Beatles on my transistor radio. Little would I know, 12 years later, I'd smoke pot with the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to rock and roll. <laughs> I didn't even smoke. <laughs> well, we were talking earlier, what, what made the Big Eight so magic, I think, was that, that strange balance of professionalism and mischief. It was, a, it was a fusion of the two, this professionalism and mischief and farting around that just made it so magical. And I think that's, uh, you, you can't replicate that. Speaking of magical, uh, Tim, I know your mom, Rosalie, she had a, uh, she had a love for R&B music. And I wanna have a, wanna hear some more music? You wanna hear some R&B? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's hear some R&B, uh, introducing some R&B. Needed some disco lights and a fog machine for that set right there. I would like to say one thing that we called that soul or R and B, you know, these these categories, these names. We never thought of music in colors ever. Great songs. Pop songs, rock songs. We play great songs, and if those don't give you a cold chill. Check your soul meter. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That makes me want to get back into radio. <laughs> I'm starting tomorrow. <laughs> that was a good station, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, more music and less garlic. <laughs> and the me and Mr. Jones, I still, I still remember me and Mr. Jones from his album, 360 Degrees. And then the story's brother Louie, Hot Chocolate, did it first. And Rosalie got Story's version of brother Louie, and it just took off. So that was awesome, but that, that's what she did. 
You know, she could take songs and say, hey, this is a little bit better, but hot chocolate had no fear. They bounced back, as you heard, with You Sexy Thing, which uh, I love that record. That was great. I mean, you couldn't sit still in the studio when you played that, right? But uh, I had this gigantic sound system in my office that we might remember, and it would rattle the walls. And Rosalie would come storming in. Just like that statue, I've seen that dance before. <laughs> you gotta hear this. You gotta hear this. We put it on and rattled the walls. People would come from other parts of the building. It was that sort of excitement that happened when you heard these songs. That we were the lucky people that got to play them for other people. What a what a what a lucky gig! And they actually paid us to do this. Yeah, they did. And one thing that Rosie and I had in common: we both like soul music. And in Jacksonville, it was kind of like a Detroit, Washington, D.C., Memphis market. We had a lot of heavy R&B on our playlist in Jacksonville. So when I came up to CK, uh, Alden was showing me around. And he took me into Rosie's office and introduced us. And I tried not to look at all the gold records on the wall and tried to pay attention as we were greeting one another, but you couldn't help it. I mean, you just, it was flabbergasting, I guess that's the word I would be, it was, it was strange, but we loved it, and I didn't tell her we had something in common, that I was a mu music director myself in Jacksonville, and I never got a gold record, but I got a thank you note from James Brown for, for adding Sex Machine, I mean, a Sex Machine, and we added that, and, you know, but anyway, that was, I wouldn't tell her, you know, I was one because I saw all this. I, was, oh, I didn't mean it that way. Exactly. <laughs> one of the things that, uh, that I, I'd like to point out now, um, it, 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 and when you go through, if your mind goes back through the songs we just heard, neither one of us wants to be the first to say goodbye, let's stay together, uh, and so on and so forth in that vein. Any of the song we played, listen carefully to it because um, I got there in 1970, and you were two years after me, and then last year were two years after Teddy. Because um, because this was also one of to me was I was talking to, to, to Tim, you know, and, and about this and Todd too. Rosalie had a superpower in addition to hearing songs. Uh, I would say right now, while those songs are playing, there was probably hardly any guys singing along with the lyrics. You're bobbing and you're doing this and all that stuff, but women at concerts would actually be singing the songs because they know the lyrics. Rosie, at that point, when I got there in 1970, she was only sort of separated and divorced maybe a year and a half, two years, somewhere in there. So it was, um, you know, and I, I saw it firsthand, and you know, as the years, as the time went by, um, she got better at, at either, you know, went by the wayside to some degree, or hit it better, or whatever. But she heard lyrics um, at a whole different level than most people, would, for sure, more than a guy, would ever hear those lyrics. So you go in, I think, you know, because that brought me back for the Gladys Knight, because I hung out an enormous amount of time in the music library, and, and you know, Bev is probably out there too, Bev Merrill, who worked with Rosie in the library, you come around the corner, you know, coming in from you know, Ron Foster's office around the other side, and you go in, and she had the Gladys Knight song on, either one of us, you know, and it's all about, you know, you know breaking up, but, but no one wants to say it, you know it's over, and all that sort of stuff. And she would be playing it, and she'd be, oh, Ah, oh, this is what you would do all the time. Ah, oh, ah, oh, holiday, come here, come here. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see that matter as you know, we went to a different goal. But, but yeah. from my vantage point at that point, um, it was like you could see that um, there was a whole other element going on there that certainly a guy, PD, or music director would never have. And, you know, and, and most women would never have it either. And uh, you know, I, you know, I think I just kept right on going, and also made her incredibly special at picking out songs. But she's again, she's picking out at six levels at once when everybody else is working on two, and then, um, we, you know, we just don't have that ability to do stuff like that. Yeah, it's amazing too how music has almost 
medication for if you're going through something emotionally. Sometimes the songs put your thoughts and feelings into a way that your brain even can't. And would you say that was probably part of the golden year because she was listening to kind of through the filter of what she was going through in her life? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, you know, Rosalie's unique ability to hear a hit, we're going to play a little montage here of some of uh, some of Rosalie's biggest hits, which are linked to a lot of really, uh, really great stories, too. Some of, some of Rosalie's uh, biggest hits that she heard right here. Ah, oh, there we go. listening and seeing, I was watching the audience get into it and seeing everyone up here listening and closing their eyes. It's, it's amazing how it triggers memories and brings it right back to that day. And some of those songs, you know, she had the golden ear. What was it she looked for in a record, do you think? And I'll open up to anybody you want. What was it she looked for? Because I know it was her golden ear, but there was there was a bit, a bit of mathematics there too as well. But what was what was that magic version, perfect potion she looked for in a song? Two minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> The great songs were too short, the bad ones were too long. <laughs> I think she was listening for a hint. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what was going in her emotions, and her heart, and her soul, and her ears. And she's looking for a hint. And there's a big difference between a stiff and a hint. Yeah. And, uh, I think she had an ear for hearing hints. Rosalie probably would have been unbelievable in a major record company running the A&R department. Yeah. 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 She stayed at CK. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and this wasn't just about her saying, I like these songs. She listened, she had something bigger in her mind saying, yeah, I like this or yeah, I don't, but this still might work. Did she, did she take many risks with songs thinking, I, like, I think it's a hit, but uh, how much she has a risk taker when, when picking songs? Well, I think she, took risk with some of them, especially we, we had to with Canadian content. But for example, with Skylark from Victoria and Vancouver, it was an interracial group in Foster, 72. That's where you got to start with Skylark. Hmm. Yeah, and, they, and she got the album, played um, Wildflower for over three months from the album, and it was Canadian content. But Rosalie was, playing Canadian content before the rule came about in January of 71 because she played Gordon Lightfoot and Murray. I mean, she was on it already, and guess who, too. But uh, that song, she played it and played it, and then the record company came out with a different song. They didn't even release Wildflower. They released something else that made it to number 66 in Canada. <laughs> and they said, this is crazy. Let's release Wildflower because the Big A kept playing the song. We never stopped playing Wildflower. And it came out and that was a monster song across Canada. <laughs> Tim, you know, I, another thing, I think she had, her ear was tuned to what would sound good, not on the radio, but on CKL Billy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's it gonna sound? Playing it in your office on those GV 1100s or whatever it's been, but there's a difference in going out in your car and cranking it up and hearing it on the car when you're moving down the road. That song feels and sounds different. And I think she had the sensibility to, to feel that when she listened to, to the song. What's that going to sound like on CK? Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody here on the radio says there's nothing yeah. like it. It's different. Come. What did she listen to at home, Tim? Well, it's funny. I had dinner with, with uh, Pat and Ted on Friday night, and uh, Nancy, Ted's wife, asked me that. And the reality is, you know, because she worked with music all day and listened to music all day, Mom personally didn't listen to a lot of music at home. But what she did do is <coughs> listen to what her kids were listening to. She raised the three of us in a very, very small home in Riverside here in Windsor, probably less than 1,200 square feet. And my sister and I especially, but, but also Todd, like we were all music heads. Uh, I was a rock kid, Diane was into Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett and, and all of that. But you know, she listened to what we were listening to. And I, and I think that, you know, she was always tuned in. And I remember her saying to me one time, 
You know, if I like something and it connects with me, I can't be the only one, so I need to put this on the radio and, and have other people connect with it as well. So she was just really tuned in. She really felt that the radio station needed to be a reflection of what was happening in pop culture. And, and the one point that I want to make here, because we just listened to a bunch of great R&B music, the one thing that, that Rosalie very consciously did, especially at the beginning of the 70s, as society was changing, uh, you know, it was a Vietnam War, R&B music was changing, it was, it, you know, Motown was evolving from being less about, you know, real perfected two and a half to three minute pop songs, all of a sudden you had the temptation singing about all the confusion, psychedelic shack. And then in 1971, Marvin Gaye comes along with this absolutely monumental, socially conscious record called What's Going On. And I can tell you for a fact that Motown wasn't sure what to do with that record because it wasn't mm -hmm. heard it through the grapevine. It, it wasn't a typical Marvin Gaye record. And, and they were kind of afraid about how that record was going to be responded to by the public. And because Motown was still at that point located in Detroit, the Motown promotion people brought that record over and they wanted to know if Rosalie thought this record was commercially viable. And I can tell you that as soon as she heard what's going on, after what had happened in Detroit with the riots of 67, you know, CKLW was really a bridge between two countries. As I said this morning at the statue unveiling, Mum felt that the world absolutely needed to hear what Marvin Gaye had to say in what was going on, that it was socially conscious, it was a great song to her ears, but people needed to hear it. All the songs we're listening to tonight have amazing stories linked to them. We're going to get to some really interesting stories that never get old a little bit later on. Uh, right now, you know, talking a lot of R&B, I want to play a little rock and roll. You guys want to hear some rock and roll yeah. right now? Cross and rock over the top 40. Here's a couple rock tracks for you. Wow, so, so rock and roll. Story. I, got a, I got a funny story. I got I to jump here, in, jump in here for a quick second. So Aerosmith, you know, they they were obviously a rock band, getting played on the rock stations in Detroit, WRIF, WABX, and and Rosalie really kind of led the way in crossing over to Top 40 Radio with Dream On. So they had played a couple smaller venues in Detroit. All of a sudden, they blow up and they play Cobo Hall and they sell out. And of course, like a lot of groups that, you know, where Big 8 was the catalyst in crossing them over, Mom got invited to the show, and of course she brought my, my, myself and my brother, I think Diane was probably still too young at this point, but after the concert, all the big wigs had come in from, from CBS Records in New York, and they had an after party, at the Playboy Club in Detroit. <laughs> Somehow, now it, was a, it was a private party, so the club was closed, but we got invited to go to the private party, and Todd was uh, in grade seven at that point. I was probably in grade, in grade nine or 10. God bless. And, and Stephen Tyler, of course, wanted to meet Rosalie, and it was a great night. And the next morning, Mom gets a call from our junior high school. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Trombley? Yes. This is a principal at Edith Cavell. I uh, have a son, Todd, who goes to school here? Yes. Um, he's selling swag from the Playboy Club. <laughs> Todd was grounded for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it was really cool growing up with a rock and roll mom. We had a lot of great, great memories together. That's wonderful. Right that is a rock and roll story right there, for sure. You just heard the Stones. Tim was telling us a story about the Stones. Do the Stones story for a Okay, awesome. so the Stones, brown sugar. 
I don't know, was that 71, 72? So back in the day when there were actually record stores, okay? Yeah. There were there were independent what we called rack jobbers. So they, they kind of looked after what were referred to back then as the mom and pop stores, not the major chain stores. They serviced all the independent record retailers. There was one in Detroit that were that was run by Jack and Linda Millman, uh, very famous family from Miami. A anyhow, they, they received early copies of the single for brown sugar. They weren't supposed to, they couldn't put it in the stores. But my mom had a really good relationship with record retailers in Detroit. And of course, Jack called mom, mom up on a Saturday morning and said, Rosalie, we got copies of Brown Sugar. Now it's not, it's, um, it's embargoed until Monday morning, but if you want to get the scoop, we got it. Do you want to meet at the station today and maybe get a jump on it? And, and like, I remember this clear as day, getting in mom's beat up Volkswagen Beetle, driving down to the station. The station was still on Riverside Drive at that point. We walked in, and as soon as mom heard those opening riffs, it was like, boom. There was, there was a person in the engineering department, in the production department. She's like, cart that up. This is going on the radio immediately. Within an hour, that song was on the air, and by Monday morning, the request lines had blown up, and the rest is history. One of the biggest top 40 signals ever. You know, radio stations have played in rock and roll and all. You mentioned something yesterday, last we were talking, saying they used to want a day part and you couldn't play a certain song that was heavy after a certain time. What, what, what was it like breaking out of, like some of the songs we heard there, MC5, you know, Santana, Deep Purple, The Stones, Aerosmith, uh, The Foreigner. Some of it's like heavier stuff. Were, were radio stations afraid of that music? A lot of radio stations were doing this day partying. Uh, they assumed that old housewives listened in the middle of the day. You can't play rock and roll there. They had all these stupid ideas. I didn't believe in day partying. A hit is a hit is a hit. I don't care what time you hear it. So I was adamantly against day partying. And it was never my thing. If you're gonna play it, play it. Was Rosalie a fan of rock and roll? Oh yeah, she loved rock. She loved, listen, she loved everything. You know, if, if it was a great song, it didn't matter where it came from or what it was. She just had an ear for a great song. and. and you know, that, that's one of the things that I think it's really important to touch on tonight. You know, mom was a legend, will always be a legend. What happened today has been so amazing. But I want everybody to understand, and I tried to convey this this morning, there are three other legends sitting up here tonight too, right? So, the music that was played on the radio station was only as great as the programming that went on behind the scenes. And these jocks, these legends that are up here with us tonight, that made the magic. Because truly, as a kid growing up there, I feel so blessed. I had a 25-year career on the record label side of the business. And growing up at this radio station had such a profound effect on me as a kid that I just have to say that, you know, one of the things that's so important to convey tonight, there's, there's a lot of people that if they were still with us would be here tonight as well, like Brother Bill Gable, like Johnny Williams, like Tommy Shannon. It was a family, it was a family of amazingly talented people. It was not just the music and Rosalie's gift, but it was the jocks, it was the jingles, it was the programming, it was the hot clock. When records were played, it's, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention tonight if we didn't talk about how the station was actually formatted and the fact that the news was at 20 after the hour and 20 to the hour when most radio stations in the market were playing new or programming news at the top and the bottom of the hour. If you were listening to the Big Eight, it swept through the top of the hour and it swept through the bottom. And, and that was, that's just one of the elements of what made it so amazing. The jingles, but I want to recognize these gentlemen that are up here with us tonight that have taken the time to come in from across North, across North America to be here. You know, mom loved them, they loved mom, and it was a combination of all the elements that made the magic. And that's very important for us all to recognize.
when you listen to the radio, you don't think that there's a little bit of science and what studying the culture and the socialization of the music and how that science and art have to be blended perfectly. And that's what CKLW was. Uh, I, I, it, I was talking to the guys yesterday and it dawned on me, I'd forgotten about it actually. And uh, the clocks, as we used to call them, the format wheel, the clock, and the way the hour was just so meticulously programmed and what happened in, you know, between this and that and the timing and what you say, you know, how you do what's called quarter hour maintenance in the science end of the whole thing. And we had these magic uh, clocks, as we called them. I took those clocks to Boston. I took them to San Francisco. Those were the exact same clocks we developed here at CKLW. Uh, I left radio for two years and went with Atlantic Records, a pretty good record company. I did that for a couple of years, and then we thought of putting music on television 24 hours a day. And MTV, to me, was a radio station you could see. It was CKLW. You could see it. The clocks were the same clocks. When you, when you watch the early years of MTV, when it was music television, remember those days? Uh, it was a radio station. It was just a radio station you could see. You didn't have to sit and watch it like a sitcom. You could cruise around your house and have it on in the background. You could even have it hooked into your stereo system. And it was a great radio station. And uh, I learned all of that right here. Tim said, it, we are honored to be here. We thank you and Todd and Diane for inviting us to be here and be a part of this just wonderful day for Rosalie. And the only thing permanent in life is change. And we all change, and that's normal, but we're not normal. <laughs> <laughs> but like Rosalie, like Rosalie, we all fell in love with this wild, wacky, wonderful entertainment music business. We love radio, and we branched out into other things since then, but we all loved it, and Rosalie did too. And I think, like Les mentioned earlier, I think the good Lord gave her a gift, really, to hear music and to decipher in her mind and heart whether that was going to be a hit or not. You know, coming from what she had to go through with a single mom with three small children having to work, you know, and raise them, uh, that was a lot of pressure on her at that age. And I think she did an awesome job with all of you. We've all been at a bunch of different radio stations, and, and th this one really was um, when you, at the time, we're all kids, we don't know anything. It's, you're just assuming this is the way all big stations must be. If I went to Chicago, it would be the same inside. But none of them are. They were they're nothing like this thing. I went to New York for a while, for, for two, three years, and I was like, well, this sucks compared to here. And I, you know, I came back. You know, but the first thing that I, this is where I'll go with the, where, where this is an anomaly. I get, I get to New York, or if it's another Drake station, it's Times Square. And the first thing that the operators, the people who do the board ops, you know, on the other side of the screen, when we're talking and you point at the song or jingle or whatever, they're there. The first thing that the ops come up and go, how do you put those under, how do you do those lay under things? How do they physically do that? Which would be um, a jingle is playing and the start of the song is starting under the jingle. It just makes the station move way faster. It's like putting your foot on the, on the gas pedal and rev the tires at a stop sign and goodbye. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, and they're like, they're in New York City with a million stations and they're listening to us trying to copy it. And, you know, and the chief engineer here, Ed Budabaugh, Ed Budabaugh was hands down. A genius. A genius. The best chief engineer in the world, pretty much. And then it's like, okay, well, okay, well, you got a great PD, you got some, you know, jocks are pretty decent, and you got this awesome engineer. What about the newsroom? Well, okay, well, in the newsroom, 
there's a guy that he just sold three million records and was you know, doing the Dallas Cowboys halftime thing with, with the Americans. It's like, you know, and, and the newsroom was awesome in itself. And, you know, 22, 24 people in there, which is unheard of for a radio station. And no matter where you went in the radio station, it didn't matter, you know, producers, people you know, cut the tape, people in the traffic department, everybody was like, you're having fun, and you show up to throw, like, you know, you're a baseball team, and you're, you show up to throw no hitters. You know, like, you know, like, you know, five hits, no, that's not good enough. You know, I want a no hitter, and that's, that's kind of the level was at. And again, I just assumed that's the way it was. Until I left, you know, it's like, wow, this is nowhere near what that was. Yeah, it, it's fascinating, actually. Um, but, man, that's rare. Yeah. It just, it was extremely rare. The news was the news, but the news was also entertainment. I mean, the legends that worked there, starting with Dick Smythe, Byron McGregor, Randall Carlisle, John Belmont, they're the legends in their own right, man. It was like, the news was entertainment. Grand Hudson, the news was entertainment as well. All the other radio stations were boring. <laughs> It blows my mind the history that we have here that New York City stations were listening to what we were doing here in Windsor. That, 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 that the clock from CKLW was used for the launch of MTV. That blows my mind that so much of that links back to here and we don't celebrate it enough. You mentioned Eddie Booterball. I love that guy. And we were all... Oh, and I mean, this engineer took it seriously. I mean, a tube meant something to him. And it had to be a special kind of a tube because it would bring the bottom in and you'd sound like a big bad dog. <laughs> Rumble and this and that. Who would think of putting the radio station in the tunnel going under the river? Eddie Booter thought of that. It's absolutely brilliant. One day he says to me, hey Garland, let's go drive the signal. Let's go what? Drive the signal. I thought this was some new exotic drug or something. <laughs> no, no, pack your bags, we're going to leave for a few days. Okay, we get two boom boxes and put them in the trunk. We go through the border and the American customs agents are wondering where the heck we're going with these two boom boxes and what are you guys up to? Well, we're going to go drive the signal. What does that mean? That's when I learned that means we're going to go tune to 800 and drive as far as we can until we can't hear it anymore. We were out for three days driving, I don't even know how many thousands of miles, <laughs> listening to this monster radio station. I, can't, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was like, wow, no one has ever said, let's go drive the signal. <laughs> we would do that at CK. I survived. Speaking of the amazing playlist of the mix that Rosie would, uh, would, would put together, I uh, want to play the pop music right about now and uh, just feel the vibe of some of these pop songs. Here we go. That's when music was music. Man, I was thinking a minute ago about one of my favorite songs Rosie ever came running in with. I don't even know if it went on to be a hit, but it sure was with CK. If you remember this, please. Let me know. I want to do something freaky to you by Leon Hayward. Yeah. <laughs> what a song. We played that. I didn't know what to do something freaky right now. <laughs> but one thing that, about the music we just heard, Rosalie was so much detail oriented for researching songs. And we played the whole gamut of, you know, but she did have, like I mentioned earlier, she, she had a heart for R&B and soul, and she had a place in her heart for Diana Ross. She couldn't hardly resist when any Diana Ross song came out. She, she almost had to put it on to give it a shot. But you can see she played songs that were, you know, not the normal, but they were popular and the audience loved them. They were all researched from, you know, requests, music sales, album sales. I mean, it was amazing what she was doing in that music library. How was that for you as DJs, uh, you know, going from 
Wayne Newton to Foreigner. Like, <laughs> it's a convoy. It's a convoy. It's a convoy. It's a convoy. What do you follow that with? <laughs> oh yeah, knife would tough. Uh, when you get like Candyman, I used to get a little crazy when that came <laughs> on on the air, but I love to shout when Kung Fu Fighting came on. <laughs> you know, I, you know, uh, Brother Bill Gable and I were taking karate at the same time. <laughs> and uh, we were both going crazy over that. But when we played earlier that montage with Barry White in it, Brother Bill had that just natural deep voice like the last, although less is deeper than Brother Bill. But Brother Bill would get real deep, you know, and try to, he would sound almost like Barry White when he introduced the record, you know. And you know what else you guys, remember I think we, apparently in some of our meetings we figured this out. Most program director, music directors, people who ran pop stations, uh, believed in these beautiful segues. We fell in love with train crashes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> train crashes are okay. That makes people, wow, that's cool. Yes. That's all right. That's a pretty wide berth that we've heard tonight. Yeah, right? yeah. That's an incredibly wide berth. Let me tell you like, another story. I had that oddly living here, but I was in the, new, in the U.S. National Guard while I was living here. I had to fly back, you know, every weekend. And, and once, once a year, you'd have to go for two weeks in, uh, um, in, in up by the Thousand Islands, except on, on the other side of the water in New York. So I go there because Barry White just kind of I, we heard the Barry White song. So Barry White, you know. First song comes out, and we're playing it here, and I think nothing of it. But the stations there uh, in Watertown, New York, are horrible. Oh my God, they are horrible. So I made a whole bunch of cassettes in real time, and they just put them on, and they just go for you know, an hour on each side. And so I'm taking them there, and and so I take them, and we're, I'm in the barracks there, and I'm playing CK, and there's people coming in continually. Like, what's that? I can't get that on the dial. Like, where's that station? And in the barracks next door to us, because the entire Eastern Seaboard whole division would come in there, there was a predominantly black company that came in from, from New York City. And you know, they're listening and they're kind of saying, what's that? What's that? Well, who's that guy? And it's the Barry White song. Yeah. And and I said, Well, this is Barry White, who's that? You never heard this song? And anyway, I kind of realized that we were almost two months ahead. Major New York City radio station <laughs> playing that and uh, other songs that they do, like uh, the radio station, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I was like, I bet that possibly be, but that's kind of the way it was here, which, which is, again, really rare. You know, Pat, you, you just mentioned something I remember. There were bootleg cassettes of CKLW flying all over the world. People would come to town and hear that radio station. I hear this radio station, and they would record it. These these bootleg air checks were all over the place. It, that's how monumentally great CKLW was. Absolutely. You don't do that anymore. Before we downloaded music, we sat there with our finger on the record button, ready for the song to come on, and you clicked it. And, and sometimes you hope, oh, please, DJ, don't talk too much over the opening. <laughs> That song, it's like they're talking over the first five seconds, but you know, that's how we got our music back then. It was that song here on the radio. Yeah, nobody talks. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> brother Bill no one has Gable. anything to say. <laughs> Again, Brother Bill Gable was the only jock I ever heard that introduced Papa was a Rolling Stone oh. all the way up. Oh, he yeah. talked that up. It had to be 30 seconds. Oh, at least, <laughs> at least. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, some, some stories, you know, the stories that never get old. I want to I open it up, and there's some good ones here. I'm going to play one more little montage of some of these songs that are linked to some stories, and then we're going to we're going to break out some stories linked to people like Yes, like Queen, like Bob Seger, like Alice Cooper. Let's play some music. Oh, so good. Really, really quickly, so I want to make getting out. How many people were at the, the Radio Revolution screening tonight? Yes. Uh, I, I, I was watching people come out of the, the screening and just kind of hearing the conversations. And there's a gentleman right up in the front row who I'm pointing at right now with a hat on who's been rocking out all night here tonight. And as he was coming to the theater, he said, how wild 
that that happened, that the Big A happened here, and we were there listening, and we were a part of it. And I thought that was just a really cool moment. I was eavesdropping. I'm sorry if that freaked you out. <laughs> but, but it struck a nerve with me how music really does connect us all. And I gotta say, it's so cool sitting in this room right now, listening to music with you and with all of you here tonight. It's a, it's. A, I feel like a very lucky person. The story is behind them, and that's where you get to right now. But it's, it's a whole awesome to sit and listen to music with people. I believe you have a bit of a story about this track. Yeah, so Queen were, ironically, on the label that I've worked for for almost 25 years, EMI Music, but in North America, Queen was on Electro Asylum. So I had gone to England in the fall of 1979 to visit a friend that had moved back home, and of course, the BBC One to me was like, the Big Eight. I'd never heard anything like the Big Eight here in North America, but the BBC One in the UK like played everything. And I heard a bunch of stuff for the first time. I heard the police for the first time. But I was a huge Queen fan, and again, Mom led the way on crossing Queen over from the from the rock stations on the top 40. But this song, crazy little thing called Love, was never going to be a single in North America because. Electra Asylum, their label for North America, thought the song was way outside of this artistic, symphonic rock band that they had broken in America. It was never going to be a single. So I brought a couple copies of the single back with me from the UK. I was working at the radio station part-time, and I came in for my shift on a Friday, and at that point, uh, Brother Bill Gable was a program director. And I played it for my mom and, and, and Brother Bill, and first listen, of course, Rosalie's like, this is a smash. We're putting it on the radio. The, the head of promotion for Electra Asylum was a fellow by the name of Kenny Batiste, who, who was one of the only promotion people, really, that mom, you know, got, he got close to the family away from the actual station. He, like Pat, for me, uh, he was like a big brother. He was a really cool guy from the east side of Detroit. And, and mom called him up Friday afternoon and said, Kenny, like, Tim just got back from the UK. He brought this Queen song with him. Like, why aren't you guys putting it out? And, and basically, Kenny said, you know, Rosalie, it's way outside of what, you know, we want them to be in North America. So we declined putting it out because it was going to be on a greatest hits record in Europe and the rest of the world. So again, much like the Stones situation or Benny and the Jets, where the station, because of my mom, our mom, put it on the air. Over the weekend, the request lines blew up, and by the beginning of the following week, Electra Asylum was trying to figure out how to get the record pressed up and get it serviced across, across North America. And it went on to be one of the biggest Queen singles in their history in terms of top 40 radio, in terms of crossover hits. And listen, I would be remiss, you heard in that mix, the uh, Queen, uh, the, sorry, the Kiss song, Beth. Okay, so the inside story on that, I'd like my sister, who's here in the audience somewhere, Diana, if you could come up and quickly tell us that story. It's a really cool story as well. Run up, Diana. <clears throat> Diane was the Kiss fan in the house. They weren't cool enough for her older brother. <laughs> I want to say thanks to everyone for coming out tonight and Thank you. you guys you have uh, you've warmed my heart <laughs> so Tim's right when mom came home from work uh, on Reed Beer, there was a big picture window in the living room and there were two small coffee tables in the middle and two love seats flanking each side on either side, okay? There were bookshelves that she had made that were on the other side of the couches, but she would lay on the couch with her feet up and read the paper, because she never had time in the morning. She wanted to relax and read the paper. Very often, her feet were folded, the slippers were falling off her feet, and she was tired. 
but you know, we would run around upstairs, do whatever we were doing. Jim was listening to music. I never had to go to a record store when I was a kid. My mom came home with her purse full of music, okay? Um, you know, I don't know if any of you grew up in Riverside and Halloween. Mom didn't give out candy, she gave out 45. Did you get one? Anyone? Okay? She did that. She did that. So, 1976, I'm 11 years old. I'm hearing records out of Tim's room, like all kinds of, you know, Jeff Rotol, uh, Queen, The Cars, lots of rock. I was getting into rock. I'd left my teeny bobber phase and, um, you know, was venturing into rock and roll. And uh, the Destroyer record came out. My mom said, here, you know, here it is. I couldn't wait to hear it. Ran upstairs, threw it on my record player, and there were three songs that stood out to me on that record. The first one was uh, Detroit Rock City, sung by Gene Simmons. Good song, killer intro. Da -da 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 -da. That song, yeah, that song rock. Okay? Then the next one was shout it, shout it. Shout it out loud, okay? Paul Stanley, okay, great song. But Beth, I mean, come on. Yeah. Just, it was the instrumentation. I don't know if you guys know that Bob Ezrin, who was featured in uh, the, the Rise and Fall of the Big A, he was the producer on that record. And, you know, Peter was doing the vocals on that record. and. You know, he realized that the guys really um, couldn't play that well. No. So um, <laughs> he decided to call up somebody and he got the New York Philharmonic Orchestra to come in and play the pretty, you know, everything that you hear in that song is really the orchestra. And Peter Chris, who really did not have his moment until that song. And so um, I listened to it and listened to it and listened to it and there was no denying the specialness of that song. It was a slow song and it, I just loved it. So I went downstairs and mom, mom, there's a slow song on a Kiss record. Like, <laughs> my mom said, oh is there? I said, yeah, I said, it's really, really, really good. And, you know, she's, I guess, surely there were promo guys working her on the single as well. But anyway, it came to pass. CKLW started to play it. It became a hit. What happens as the band is touring for the Destroyer album? And this gave Peter Chris his moment because he left his drum kit and would come down and sit on a stool and sing his song. And it was a beautiful song. So it, it kind of elevated his presence within the band. Oh, yeah. As a thank you, the band was coming to town and mom said, would you like to meet them? Oh, mom, yes, I'd like to meet Kiss. So went over to the Poncho Train in Detroit. Don't know if it's still called the Poncho Train. No, even not. It exists. What's it called? I don't know. Crown Plaza. Well, I think Tim says it was the Rock and Roll Hotel at the time yes. in the 70s. But top of the spot. Yeah, so we had dinner on the top floor. And when we got there, the band was not there. And somebody said, oh, hey guys, the band's going to be coming down in about five minutes. Be ready. So suddenly, the elevator doors open. The guys come streaming out, and it was just them. There was no entourage with them. It was the four guys without their makeup on. <laughs> okay? Did you no, I didn't run. Um, they, they all had kazoos in their mouth. And the tune they were playing was Yankee Doodle Dandy. I was spellbound. I did not know that I would be having dinner beside Gene Simmons that night, which I did. 
I remember Gene ate chicken and salad. He ate very healthfully for dinner. He, he seemed to care about what he was eating. I'd never met anyone who kind of was asking how the chicken had been prepared and how he liked his vegetables crunchy and not soggy, that kind of thing. He, I would not call Gene a handsome man. <laughs> the only one that had a little bit of lipstick on that night was Paul Stanley. And it was this bright red, perfectly applied lipstick. He had no shirt on, but a vest. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> when I tell you that he was a sexy man, he was very sexy. What about the Well, uh, and as well that night, Mom kept saying, come on, you gotta talk, you know, you don't get to meet people like this all the time. And I was just tongue-tied. But I wanted to meet Peter because for me, Peter became the pivotal guy in KISS. So he was over against the wall with the woman. And I went over and said hello, and he introduced me to a woman, but her name wasn't Beth, her name was Lydia. And that's who we wrote the song Beth for. Now, here, here's not to jump in, Diane, but here's, here's again, because it was asked earlier, what did mom listen to at home? Right. She listened to what we were listening to. Beth was never intended to be a singer. It wasn't intended. Beth was the song on the album that the band allowed Peter to sing to kind of, you know, assuage him, make him feel like he was part of the band. So my sister heard that song as a hit, and again, it was one of their biggest singles. It ever. worked. It worked. And I'm glad that so it did. That's, that's really cool. And I do remember, I asked him for his autograph. And Gene was, you know, they all signed my autograph book. And he had recently started um, putting a dollar sign in S in the Simmons, in the S on Simmons. And he looked at my mom and said, um, Oh, you know, sometimes I forget how I spell my last name. And mom said, Well, maybe that happens, but I'll bet you never forget that dollar sign now, do you? <laughs> and he looked at her and he said, that's right, I don't, I'm a businessman. <laughs> and he meant it, he meant it. Like he, his intelligence surprised me. And his, 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 his confidence, his swagger, Gene had that in spades. And he asked me, where are you guys sitting? Come to the show tomorrow night? I said, yes. He said, where are you sitting? Mom said, Fifth Royal Center. He said, listen, if there's anybody bugging you, Point him out, I'll spit blood. <laughs> that, that is rock and roll. Right there. That is rock and roll. So is Chris Cole in the zoo with that uh, makeup to hate you, man. That's pretty rock and roll as well. I'm intrigued by one thing. Uh, you were tongue tied? I was. I'd like to see Gene Simmons talk this time. <laughs> sit here all night and tell these stories because they are as infinite and as eternal as the music. Thank you so much, Diane. That was incredible. That was absolutely amazing. So I'd like to thank, again, these very special gentlemen in all of our lives, Todd, Diane, and I, our, our community that we've come out tonight to honor Rosalie, these gentlemen are here. They've come in again from across North America to honor Rosalie. There's a few people that are here tonight that I'd also like to acknowledge because we put a lot of work into this night, into the music selections that you heard tonight. My brother Todd, who is here tonight, literally probably spent 100 hours going through the Big 30 charts from, the, from 68 all the way through the 70s. The songs that you heard us play tonight in these montages weren't played by accident, okay? These were songs that Todd, through his research, followed up the chart 
from Hit Bell. Most of them ended up as number one records, if not number one, they landed in the top five. So Todd, thank you for putting in the effort. And there's a fellow who's here tonight that works with me at the casino on the production team for the Coliseum, David Saran. He put these amazing montages together. So David, thank you. around that have been here for the weekend. It's been a great weekend of stories, everybody getting together, reminiscing, remembering Rosalie. Jojo, I see you sitting out there. We're just so grateful that everybody has been here today to celebrate such an amazing moment. So on that, I would like to say to everybody, thank you tonight, thank you for the day. It's been an absolutely joyful day, one of the best days of certainly my life, and I'm sure Todd and Diane feel the same. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.